Good afternoon and good evening to, to everyone that has joined us for the third of 10 COP26 speaker series hosted by Corn Ferry. Uh, thank you all for joining. We will pause for just a few seconds. It looks like there's quite a few people logging in now. All right. Well, again, uh, my name is Meredith Moot. I'm a senior partner with Corn Ferry, and I would like to welcome everybody to the third in our, our series of COP26 speaker events. Um, sitting here today with Rory Lamont, and we'll ask Rory to introduce himself here in a minute, but so pleased uh, to be a part of this incredible speaker series and, and this lead up to such a wonderful event at COP26 coming up in November. And, um, I've been with our Corn Ferry for about 10 and a half years now and spent all of that time in logistics and transportation. And uh, I like to think that we were really focused on sustainability before it was even cool. In my family growing up, my, uh, my family had, um, we would bring recyclable items home from school and vacation and restaurants and there wasn't a plastic bag allowed in our house. And now full circle, it's a part of the fabric of everything we talk about at professionally and, and personally on the environmental side. So just so pleased to be a part of this. And as a part of our logistics and transportation practice, uh, really focused a lot on rail and uh, rail plays such a large part in ESG and, and so much of the, uh, the opportunity ahead of our, our entire globe and, and certainly in terms of climate change and environmental impact. And so I will ask Rory to go ahead and introduce himself and uh, then we'll get started with our discussion. Rory? Well, good morning, good afternoon, or as it is almost evening from uh, from London to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here with you, Meredith, and uh, also with the rest of you. Uh, I'm quite excited about having the, the chance to discuss this topic with you. It's one that fascinates me. Um, I have a slightly different background from yourself, Meredith. My, uh, my father used to be a shift charge engineer in a power station in Scotland. So some people might think that's kind of on the other end of the environmental scale. But I remember very clearly he used to say to me as a kid, Rory, it's not me that creates the, the damage in the environment. It's everybody that turns their lights on. If nobody turns their lights on, I don't have to produce any energy. And uh, whilst that's a slightly controversial view, it does stick with me in that it, it reminds me that I have a personal part to play in what's going on around me today. The choices I make influence the environment I live within. Um, and as a business leader, the choices I can help companies make mean that those companies can have a positive or a negative impact on the environment. And that's really why I'm passionate on this topic, especially because I feel that working within Hitachi Rail, the product we have can make a positive impact in the transition we're going through. And very importantly, the supply chain that I line up to support our product portfolio can also make a massive impact. And I'm really encouraged by what I'm already starting to see, but I'm very keen to make sure that that comes through even quicker so we can make the transition uh, even more quickly to a, a net carbon uh, neutral environment. Excellent. Well, Rory, maybe tell us a little bit more about your role and then I, sure. I wanna talk about Hitachi's press release to get us going. Okay. Well, I'm the CPO for the rail business unit. So that means I lead a, a team of about 360 supply chain professionals around the world from places like Kasado in the, the south, of, uh, south of Japan or in Tokyo, through Naples, Pistoia, Reggio Calabria, into the UK in London and then Newton Aycliffe and then over into somewhere a bit closer to you in Pittsburgh uh, and in Miami. Um, that team manages around about, depending on where we are with our project cycles, about two and a, two and a half to three billion dollars every year, covering you know exciting you know areas like generator units or signaling technology, uh, engineering services to help us develop the next suite of our products to more of the kind of traditional areas like energy, electricity. Um, office services, the full, the full suite. So it's a great CPO's job. It's one of the, the few where I report to the CEO. So I'm kind of on a par with the CFO, which I, I quite enjoy. Um, <laughs> and it's also one that, you know, the, the company is growing massively. We were uh, about two and a half thousand employees 10 years ago. We're now 13,000 employees globally. We're hopefully going to grow through a, a, an acquisition we announced about 25,000 
um, employees, but we're part of the larger Hitachi group, which is a fantastic position to be in, especially with a conundrum or with a problem like we have here, because I have a peer network of CPOs around the world, some of which work in very parallel uh, industries like automotive, some of them that work in very different industries like our, our, our Internet of Things business unit. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm quite lucky to have that, that, that sort of oversight and, and help that comes from, from the parent company as we try and figure out a path forward on this topic. Oh, great. Good. Well, again, thank you for being here. So let's dive in quickly, I think, mm. to um, a really brilliant and exciting headline and press release from Hitachi on September 13th. So mm. um, I'm not going to display it, but anyone who's who would like to go back and, and read it, uh, please do. It's very easy to find on Hitachi's website. But Rory, I'll ask you to talk about that. But before I do, just a quick note, if anybody has any questions or, or comments that come up as Rory walks us through uh, a bit of the exciting news here, please do put those in the Q&A uh, section and we'll be monitoring them as we go. But Rory, tell us about the September 13th press release. Sure, you know, so we, we previously announced about transitioning to being carbon neutral within our operations by, by 2030, so, so nine years from now. And at the same time, we'd announced about reducing our carbon emissions in our supply chain by 80%. We've actually revised that statement, and this is why um, the, the, the article from Andy Barr, our CEO, came out uh, this week, to start to explain you know, why we've made that shift and then how we're going to start making the shift to being a, 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 net, a net zero uh, company or business unit within Hitachi Rail. Um, we think it's important because, A, we can see that we part, play a part in the transition, as I, I talked to already. Uh, uh, already. But B, it's, it's really important that myself and the leadership team in the business unit start to talk openly about some of the challenges we have. And I'll, you know, I'll be delighted to talk about that later on, but also to start to share our ambition with our customers and with the supply chain. And one of the things we've found that you know, we have probably 250 core suppliers in our, in our supply base just now, probably a supply base of about 12,000 all in for our business unit. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we do every year, every year I have um, a supplier event and at that event, we pick a theme, right? So last year it was growing together because we were going through an expansion phase, especially in, in the US. And um, this year, we're probably gonna do it in you know, the end of the financial year, and it will be all around our environmental ambition in line with COP26. But I think you know, that, that communicating with the supply base is really key. You need to be explaining what it is that's driving, not just me as a CPO, but actually what's driving our customers and making sure that they understand that and that the suppliers have a chance to reflect, right? And then bring back to us the ideas. And, you know, articles like we put out this week are a really effective way of doing that. Um, the category managers are a really effective way of doing that as well, you know, but we make sure we use as many mediums as we can to start to disseminate the message. So today, um, or this week rather, we started to be a lot clearer on how we are approaching decarbonization. And for us, um, it's really key to have a handle on the data, okay, as a starting point. So, you know, we, we were quite public in, our, um, in our, um, our CRS report about the decarbonization that we managed to achieve last year. So across scope one, two, and three, we dropped um, our emissions against 2019 baseline by about 14%. Wow. And, you know, we intend to continue that, that transition down. So starting to explain our approach, so measuring scope one, which is our emissions you know, through our day-to-day -day activities, scope two, the emissions that we create through the services we use in our facilities, and then okay. scope three, the emissions that are generated by our supply chain and by our products. So just cascading that message down gives us a common frame to start discussing the overall topic with the suppliers that we work with. So, you know, Andy was really, really pleased to put that out today as part of our run up to COP26. And I think, you know, we'll continue to um, continue to communicate more and more as we run up to um, the event in Glasgow, a town that I, I know very well because I spent five years of my life and uh, most of my <laughs> tertiary education there. Um, but it's just a kind of key first step to us to start to communicate with our supply chain and help them understand our aspirations and also hopefully to send the message that we're really serious on this topic and to differentiate ourselves from the other actors in the supply chain. I think that's a key part 
and for us to talk a little bit more about maybe later on. Absolutely. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about COP26 specifically. So sure. why uh, why did Hitachi decide to be a sponsor? And, and maybe just tell yeah. us a bit more about leading up to the event, some of the what you're seeing, some of the noise around it, some of the opportunity and excitement. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go ahead and share a slide um, with the group here. Sure. It's, a, it's going to be a great event for Glasgow as a city. Um, it's, you know, I was there about two or three weeks ago, and it's fair to say that, that you know, the city's changed quite a lot through the COVID pandemic. And uh, I think it'll be a great opportunity for the city to advertise itself on the world stage again. You know, the reason that Hitachi is there is that we see ourselves being able to play a part in decarbonization in many different areas, okay? And you know, Hitachi is a 300,000 employee conglomerate. We have several different sectors within that, but there are two really key sectors that we think can play a, a massive role. So the mobility sector, okay, which covers the, the transportation, the sector I work within, but also energy. And we see the two being able to come together to allow us to make the modal shift from air transportation to a lower carbon version of transportation within rail, but also to help us solve the energy distribution challenge that you have as you start to move away from using hydrocarbon as a power source and moving more towards energy distributed over large networks and made available for several different modes of transportation. And so we saw the uh, the COP26 event in Glasgow is a really great opportunity to position ourselves firmly within that space to say that we are very serious about this you know we've always been about we've always been as a company about providing superior solutions okay that mm -hmm. was a, a kind of an old an, a, an old uh, mission statement from from Hitachi we're now being very clear that we see ourselves as being a, a climate change innovator and so this is clearly a, a key uh, event for us to be seen at and be able to start to build our networks. Um, as I said, I see the solutions coming from several different companies in several different sectors. And so being within the conversation in Glasgow um, next month is, is absolutely key for us. Okay, good. So uh, you said climate change innovator, uh, mm. really curious what that means to you at, at leading the supply chain, leading uh, procurement for yeah. Hitachi Rail? Um, you know, in a, I think a lot of people in the procurement world talk about, you know, finding innovation as a sort of the next, the next source of value, you know, and with you know, anybody that's been in and around procurement and supply chain in the past 20 years, well, I'm sure have, you know, been wrestling with how do you start to manage categories? How do you take categories from shaping the supply base, generating value, which often starts with savings, and then into joint partnerships where you both, you know, you both create um, benefits for the companies or your relevant companies together. I think this is the next step, right? And it is about how do you find the relationships that allow you to meet your customers' needs. But I actually think now it's going to be about the lateral relationships you can build to help you solve the common problems you have about decarbonizing your business. So I said at the start, I would talk about some of our key challenges. Um, and, you know, we're starting to, to talk about these internally. And so, you know, I'll be very transparent. One of the key ones is that, you know, I, I build aluminium tubes, right? The body of a train. Mm -hmm. That aluminium is extracted from the ground. It's turned from ore into aluminium panels. It's then welded into you know, a car body shell. And mm -hmm. then we do the final fit out. And that extraction, refining and shaping and transportation process is one that I see as it very complex to decarbonize. So some of the thinking I've been doing with my team is how do, how do I solve that? I don't have the answer yet, but I certainly know that thinking laterally, Airbus will have the same problem, Boeing will have the same problem. To some extent, Astemo, our, our automotive business unit has the same problem, but so <laughs> will all the tier one automotive manufacturers, right? And I think it's that type of thinking and that type of sharing that will allow us to really um, accelerate down the decarbonization route as a network of companies, you know, a supply chain network working together. Um, and I'm, I'm, that's what gets me excited about this. It's kind of taking the procurement approach into the next arena rather than just staying in the old one of, you know, running my categories, making sure I'm well aligned with sales and engineering and, you know, having a great bottom line impact, but not really 
doing anything on the real challenge that sits in front of us. Thank you, Rory. And why don't you take us through a bit of the, the breakdown of the opportunity specifically sure. for rail? You know, so this is the, you know, I think a lot of companies at the moment are still thinking through what does decarbonization mean for us as a company? And then, then what does it mean for our supply chain? This is our view of what it means for the rail business unit. So mm -hmm. it's around helping make the modal shift away from cars and planes and encouraging people to use shared transport to help get them around in day-to-day -day environment and for some of the longer distance, um, the longer distance trips we do. You know, why is this the right shift to make? Well, if you look at the carbon emissions that come from planes or from trains um, or from cars, you know, the train per kilometre is really low already in comparison to those other two methods. And if you think about some of the um, some of the technology to come, some of the maglev or hyperloop type technology, the carbon mm -hmm. um, emissions from that technology is even lower. And so that's why we're excited about helping that, uh, that network build itself up. You can further decarbonize existing rail solutions by shifting the, the type of fuel you use, okay? And so that's why we're spending a lot of time looking at electrification and at batteries. Now, I'm sure many of you are thinking, what about hydrogen? Hydrogen for us is an interesting option, but most of the existing rail infrastructure is either totally electrified or partially electrified. And to make the jump from um, electrification and batteries to hydrogen, the capital investment required is actually quite heavy. So we really see a future where rail is electrified and then with the use of batteries where there isn't electrification available on the rail infrastructure, as the key next step to further reduce the carbon emissions from, from the networks we put in place. And then we come on to you know, the value chain. You know, so scope one, better energy management in our factories, investing in renewable energy. And then we need to start looking at the design of our product. Um, there was a great article in the FT yesterday, which talks about the de you know, decarbonization of the automotive supply chain and, and cars. Some of the mm -hmm. thinking in that was fab fabulous. There's a, there's a conceptual design of a new car from BMW, where you know the steering wheel is made from um, is made from reformed wood. They've mm -hmm. completely thought through again the 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 structural design of the car to make it very easy to remove damaged panels and replace damaged panels. They've got rid of the BMW logo because it's got, uh, I think it's got a large de degree of plastic in it, if I remember correctly. And what they've done is they've embossed the logo on the bonnet of the car. So they've retained mm -hmm. the branding, but they've really thought quite deeply about how do I take the carbon and, and, and simplify the design? I, mean, I think that's fantastic. I really look forward to getting into that type of thinking with our engineering teams. I think the final point is, you know, how, how do you start all this? I mean, you know, Nothing on this slide is particularly um, revolutionary. I think the thing that will set Hitachi apart from the other companies in this space is actually getting into action on this. And that's, that's something I'd love to exchange views with the audience on. And uh, I'm very happy to share what our approach is and, and, and what it's likely to shape out to be. Well, I, I'm curious, Rory, as, as we look at this, these phases mm -hmm. and we look at these different uh, in lines of action here. Is this the result of a lot of time spent with those 12,000 suppliers or, or is this something that they really are reacting to? And, and either way, what's been the uh, the reaction of, of some of the manufacturers and other suppliers that, that you all work with? Some of them, it's quite, it's strange. That there is no, it's hard to correlate between size complexity of you know, size of supplier, complexity of product, geographic location. I don't see much correlation between those, but there's there's a couple of really key themes, right? Some of them, some of our suppliers are coming and saying, we're on with this, we want to talk to you about this, right? This specific product we have or this problem that we see that you have. Or they're in the other end of the spectrum, it's Rory, we don't really know we know we need to do something, but we don't really know what we need to do, mm. right? And it's trying to trying to figure out how you can get involved at, at, at either end. 
So where we have suppliers coming with ideas, quite often it's trying to screen those ideas. It's, it's almost like any other innovation um, mm. idea that's coming from the supply chain. It's trying to screen those ideas with the category team in the first instance, thinking about do they start to meet needs that we have? And, and when I talk about needs, we often try and think about our customers' needs. So ultimately the, the person using the train in the mm -hmm. first instance, and then maybe the person or the, or the company that runs the train, often that can be ourselves. Um, or, you know, do we see a commercial angle on it that we can we can bring into the, the conversation? That's how that, that um, channel typically runs. On the other end, you know, I, I tend to have conversations a bit like the one we're having here, you know, so if you don't know where to start, you know, what's the, what's the reason of being for your business going to be? Will it survive in a net zero mm -hmm. future? Right. Um, and I think some of our suppliers are, are thinking that, thinking that through quite seriously. Hmm. If, if they have thought that through and are, are sure, yes, we've got, we, we can see a future for ourselves. I really encourage them to to start the measurement process. You know, you know, we've we've gone from about 70, 77 thousand tons of CO two emitted per year in our business scope one to three to about sixty six thousand tons of CO two emitted per year, and we've taken the time to measure that. And by measuring it, you start to understand where the sources come from, and you can start to then think about you know how do I how do I break apart this situation to reduce the carbon we emit. Um, and again, I think it plays really well into a lot of the, the classic procurement thinking or learning that we've, we've gone through in the past 20 years. Any procurement professional that's run a, a cost down or a savings program, I think mm -hmm. we all know that to achieve that target, there's typically 100, 200, 300, you know, a thousand different things, different little projects you have to do to make a serious dent in a large number. I think decarbonisation is exactly the same. Okay, you need to be thinking about the carbon that is coming from the three sources. You need to think about where does it come from across the world, and quite quickly you get into many dimensions, and you need to put in place many small actions to make a tangible, a tangible change to what you're doing. I think that's a, that's a real point of complexity, and many companies are going to struggle with that, and we, mm. we are ourselves still trying to get that that right. Well, and I know this entire um, entire topic is incredibly complex, and so I don't want to oversimplify it. But is there mm. any kind of low hanging fruit from a pers from a procurement perspective that your peers could be tackling to even build the proof mm. point for the for an entire campaign? Yeah, I mean, I kind of admire. There's a small company in London that I was reading about, and I, they're, they're actually a headhunting company in the city of London. Um, and they're going to go for a net zero month next year. And I thought that's cool. That, that's like that's a really good, you know, testing at that. How how can we go for a, a, a month without admitting it, emitting any carbon? It's quite a it's quite a big jump. But I admired that as as a, a really strong leadership position and, a, and a, a real target to go for. I'm not sure all of us are going to go for that that type of approach. And this company probably has 60 employees with a couple of offices in London. Um, I think. You know the classic you know where do you source your energy from so hitachi within europe not just hitachi rail but hitachi within europe has moved from traditional sources of brown energy and we're in the middle of transitioning to green energy right i think that's a, you know a place to look at quite quickly your use of travel again you know i think that's another quite easy one we've come through a period where travel wasn't possible right mm -hmm. So many of us have started to, or have changed our behaviors completely related to travel. So a procurement lever, you might be able to drop your procurement, your, your travel budget dramatically, and therefore not only take the cost out of your business, but also reduce the CO2 emissions associated with travel in your business. Um, energy conservation in the office, you know, the number of times I walk out of our office at night and the monitors are all still on standby. Mm. There's a really simple one, right? We're going to get in this together. And I think that's a, a key one is getting change in people's behaviors, right? You know, take the time, put that finger, you know, reach it forward and hit the little button underneath your monitor and kill the energy that's going to get mm -hmm. wasted overnight. Close your laptop off, right? So I think you need to, um, there's lots of little things. And there's lots of little things you can, you know, steal with pride, from, from peers around the industry or, or through your professional networks and start. 
would be my my real um you know you, you must start and you must start soon if we're going to decarbonize in nine years our scope one and two we have still got a long way to go okay um the other positive if you're sitting in a cpo's chair is mm -hmm. that actually scope three is probably not as scary as you think right because your scope three is your supplier scope one and two okay hmm. so if we can take out you know 14 percent of our emissions in a year your supply chain can probably do something similar all right and that you know 14 percent is already a great first step so i would really encourage you to if you're in a procurement role get talking to your suppliers, share what you've done in scope one and two, see if they can do the same, right? And then have the second topic, which is what are the things that scare you in your business? How do you think, you know, where are the real challenges in your business to decarbonize and how can we work together on it? Or how can I connect you with somebody might, who might have already gone some way to solving that problem? Mm -hmm. Roy, you just answered one of the questions <laughs> that right. has been sent along to us about yeah. bringing vendors along in the journey. Um, yeah. But a, a couple of other great questions on here. And, and one is really a note of appreciation for the ecosystem approach that, that you all yeah. are taking. Uh, but the question is, are there other systems that support this kind of collaboration? For instance, the Sustainable Procurement Pledge community. Yeah, I think there's absolutely a role to be played there, right? And you know, if that feels like the right road for your company to go down, then by all means, you know, get down that get down that road. I think the, the the message I'm trying to send here is it's all about not being scared of the problem and not feeling that the problem is yours or yours alone to solve because it, it simply can't be. It just the speed we have to do this at it means that we need to you know work collaboratively. Excuse me to solve the problem. And if if it feels more natural for your company's culture or for your company to use a quite stringent and structured approach then then you know go for that i think the the hitachi culture is a very collaborative one um, mm -hmm. you know i think many of us at, at business school or during our education might have read about you know japanese kaizen um, approaches one of the things i've really appreciated about moving from um a, you know a kind of anglo-saxon company to a, a japanese company is the depth of relationship that we we like to build with our supply chain and by depth, I mean the, the long, longevity of it. And I think that's really useful for us now in this time because we're perceived as a company that invests in relationships, takes them exceedingly seriously and um, to the extent that a supplier relationship is, is viewed in a very similar manner to a customer relationship within Hitachi. Um, it's nurtured in the same way. And I think that's really important for us now because it allows us access to have conversations not with not you know not CPO to CPO but CEO to CEO about how we can take on this challenge. Um, so I wouldn't be shy about having the, the conversations with your suppliers, but remember there's probably a couple of ways to have the conversation. You know, talking to the head of environmental might be a great first place, but maybe you might need to influence to get into the top of the company mm -hmm. to really understand what their core challenges are or the points that they're struggling with. And that's certainly something I've, I've done with a few of our suppliers and, and one of which will be uh, coming along with us at COP26 to talk about the work we've done together. Okay, good. So uh, the next question that I, I do want to pose it takes us into, I think, the, the natural next step here is how you're going about uh, decarbonization in the supply mm. chain. And a question from one of our, our participants is around having hard targets for uh, CO2 for your buying teams, and how are you measuring those, uh, if so? So take us through it, how mm -hmm. you talked a little bit about measuring, but how you're doing that internally, and, and then we'll kind of walk through just overall the execution here. Yeah, and the, the target piece is a, is a really good, um, it's a really good way to, to approach it. As I, as I said, the targets that we're setting are really more, they're not actually set to the procurement team, okay? and this depends again on company culture mm -hmm. because we're in a manufacturing environment okay and a lot of the product we actually design ourselves and then and then source components from the supply chain the challenge is actually set to the engineering team as well as the procurement team okay and it's held jointly and i think that's for us a, a really good way a really good way to approach it and it's then 
often actually the the targets are almost imposed on us from the customers we're working with as well right so it might be that we are working with a customer who's evaluating us on a net present value basis rather than a cost basis and that's really helpful okay because you can start to look at net present value which may or may not explicitly include the carbon emissions and i think some of our customers might want to think about think about that as a way to procure trains and um, but certainly when you start to take into account things like weight noise and energy consumption within that net present value um, uh, evaluation actually drives you into um, a decarbonization mode of thinking almost without realizing it and certainly one of the, the 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 things i'm observing on more and more of our bids is that the explicit request around what's the carbon um uh, emissions from your product or how are you starting to decarbonize or um what's the amount of carbon you can take out of the supply chain over this duration of a contract is a question we're getting asked more and more frequently and i do think that's a real challenge for procurement organizations to take on or for the wider organization because it's not a question we've really been asked before so maybe a question back to the audience and maybe you can put into the chat would you be able to tell would you be able to give your sales team or your bid team the answer to that question would you honestly be able to say this is the amount of carbon we we emit or this is the amount of carbon we know we can take out from the supply chain and this is how mm. you would do it i think that's a real it's a it's a challenge and it's one you need to get ready to to answer because it's going to start coming from your customers i'm, I'm absolutely sure of it Keep digging into that a bit more and, and just the execution side of this. Uh, on the Hitachi website, there's a fantastic just kind of introductory video that takes us through some of the different elements of the, the mm -hmm. journey. And uh, I'll move us along here, but talk us through kind of how you're going about this with the execution data. Sure. So if we think about um, decarbonizing our uh, our operations in the factories, right? We've been going through a, a way of thinking about energy consumption. So we've looked at energy consumption of the, the lighting systems and we've made some investments um, in new lighting technology that's much more energy efficient with a net payback of about four years, okay? We've also looked at the fact that our factories have typically large flat roofs. And you know, even, even in the UK, a large flat roof, you can install a, a solar panel on and you can e generate electricity from. So some of our factories actually in the not too distant future will be able to produce about 50% of their own energy. And we're looking at ways to keep pushing that forward so that maybe we'll be in a position to generate enough energy for our own needs and then export back to the grid. The slide you're sharing now is quite an interesting one, Meredith, and it's one that we've used internally to think about um, one of the SDGs, so sustainable cities and communities. Obviously, from a, a product standpoint, we slot in very well into this because we can start to help take pollution out of cities by taking cars off the road, moving, as we say, people from aeroplane air, travel, hopefully onto, onto rail travel. And one of the conversations we had with the sales team was around looking at which of the countries on this map are doing well at achieving um, the sustainable cities goal and which ones are not doing well, right? Mm -hmm. So in some ways, you could look at this on the lens of, well, there's loads of places we could go after here because they have a challenge to address, address the problems of creating sustainable cities. And that was... You know, one way that we looked at this with the sales team. The other way was to look at, well, where are the countries that are doing well? Mm -hmm. you know, have we worked with them? Are, are, is, there a, you know, is there a good degree of congruency between what they're trying to achieve and what it is that we're doing? And actually, maybe we'd be better off directing some of our attention into these countries rather than the other countries. And that's quite a, that's quite a fruitful conversation, actually, with the sales team. Uh, but I think it does take you into a world with, as a business if you're seen to be really working on this topic actually accessing new territories you know if you're doing well in the territories really working on the topic accessing could be could be easier and then similarly you you can quite clearly see where the uh, the untapped potential sits for your uh, for your product and solutions around the world very good i'll keep moving because these are fascinating mm. 
Yeah, and I think one of the one of the things that, I, that we did as a team as we, we started to to work on this was really trying to take some time to educate yourself on on this. Right, mm-hmm. you need to understand there's a couple of key key constructs: so the SDGs and the ESGs. Right, so two two key constructs that you need to start to really read up on. Um, some of it's great reading, some of it's a little bit dry, <laughs> right? <laughs> but until you understand that framework, it, it becomes quite hard to be uh, to be really conversant on the topic. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there was another there's another picture I suggested we share as well, Meredith. Maybe next slide down could prompt some thoughts as well. Yeah. You know, I, again, here we looked at which countries are particularly um, keen on investing in infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So clearly, for us. The infrastructure, either you know, to to run a railway, either we can provide, or you know, we um, we provide the trains that might run on that infrastructure. And you can see that Italy um, is really seems being well on track to achieving the SDG around that core market for us. America again seems to be performing well. Another market that we're we're very active in and looking to penetrate even further. Um, and this is publicly, you know, publicly available information that's um, put out, I think, every year. So you see it's from the Sustainable Development Report 2021 mm-hmm. from the, the Cambridge University Press. And um, the amount of information that's now in the public domain on this topic is really quite astounding. Um, I have a lady in my team, Terry Johnson, who really stays abreast of a lot of this for us. Um, and she spends a phenomenal amount of time trying to stay on top of the the performance data, the changing um, uh, legislation, and what it, what I'm, I would observe as a trend is that we are seeing more and more governments translating the aspiration of decarbonisation into legislation, which hmm. is obliging companies to operate in a certain way. And I think that is a key point to 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 digest is actually decarbonization I think quite soon is going to become a kind of minimum standard mm-hmm. to operate in, in in certain countries and therefore again another great reason to get it out on the top table and discussed um, and if it's not out on the top table and being discussed I think that's a, a key risk for, for the company to think about and to act on. Well, let's go to the next slide Rory and, mm. and walk us through this one as well. Mm. I think here, I think it was you know, <laughs> being able to provide a, a decent working environment. Mm-hmm. Again, this is more of a more of a, a sales piece of sales thinking we did. You know, our view is the product that we we offer can contribute again to creating a good, you know, decarbonized, healthy or more healthy environment in cities. And therefore, mm-hmm. where have we got? Um, where have we got opportunities? Flipping it from a sales to supply chain view, you can take this as a, a, a kind of quasi analysis of the labor um, regulations in the countries where you may have suppliers. Okay. Um, so it's maybe drifting a little bit from the, the decarbonization topic, but it's one of the key areas of, of, of risk and risk management for the business unit that I look at is where do we have supply chains that may have child or forced labor? in it and this picture you know paints a thousand words when you start to show this to execs you know if you've got a handle on your supply chain data it's quite easy Mm -hmm. to map onto this where your major supply chains sit or where the at least the headquarters of the major suppliers you work with sit and use that as a a rough indicator of you may have suppliers that you need to be more attentive to on this point than others interesting okay well and and with Mm. that i Going to the next slide as well, Rory. These are, um, uh, it's a lot of red on here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, it's, it's pretty painful. I've been in the office, for, like I said, as we were chatting for the first time in probably a year and a half, maybe 20 months, I was in the office four days this week and I had quite a few early starts and a few later finishes than I would have liked. So I got in, you know, got on the tube early, came off the tube, that's the metro for you guys that don't speak uh, English, English. Um, and I went and got myself some breakfast. Yeah. So I went to the coffee shop and I don't buy coffee. I drink tea. So I didn't have a disposable cup, but I did buy some porridge. 
Um, and, you know, I had porridge in a paper carton and the lady behind the counter was said, oh, look, there's your plastic spoon, there's your napkin, and here's a paper bag to take your paper pot in. And my office is literally 20 metres around the corner. Um, I simply had a sandwich for lunch, which came in, you know, a paper wrapper. Um, and I think it's just, it's quite scary the amount of waste that you can create in a day. You know, if I'd been at home, I wouldn't have had created any of that waste. Um, and I think it's kind of, it's quite interesting when you look at the areas that are red, you know, it's kind of very, the very developed economies where the amount of um, responsible consumption is maybe not where it should be. Um, I alluded to it at the start of the conversation, you know, taking personal ownership for some of this is a really important point. And I'm certainly, you know, I, I'm very conscious now. I don't take the paper bag. There are spoons in our office that I can use and then wash. You know, I can have a cup of tea and a cup, in a, you know, a ceramic cup in the office. I don't need to, being Scottish, spend the money on a coffee, but I also don't need to generate the waste that goes along with that coffee mm -hmm. if I can wait two minutes and get it in the office. Um, so yeah, I mean, responsible. Coming back to the business angle, responsible consumption and production for us here is, you know, if if we are going to look at sources of supply, are the sources of supply coming from these regions really operating to the same level we would be as a first kind of measure, and then are they going to be able to meet some of the the, the decarbonisation aspirations that we have? Again, you can't you can't make a one to one correlation to say if it's in Australia there's going to be a problem, but it is a good proxy to start to you know get you thinking down some of the lenses on um, on sustainability that might be important to your company. You know, and certainly for us, that SDG um, number eleven around um, uh, sustainable cities is a really key one for us. It's really interesting as I sit here next to. Um you know, a plastic bottle of water, feeling very ashamed, <laughs> contributing to my, my red USA. <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 it. Yeah. I think it's just about being conscious. I've got, I've got my, uh, my reusable bottle here. There you go. <laughs> there you go. We balance each other. Well, we've got some really, really fantastic hmm. questions. Uh, so I want to pose a few of these to you. One is around really measuring all of this mm -hmm. and yeah. You know, I, I think you just alluded to a couple of things that it's not so much measuring uh, responsible consumption of your your suppliers. You can't monitor their plastics yeah. usage, but but how do you combine all of these things together? And, and then let's mm. let's dig into some other ways to measure as well. Yeah, sure. One of the one of the steps we've taken recently is to um, to bring on board a service from a company called Ecovaris. There's plenty of other companies that provide a similar service which we're going to use as part of our supplier qualification process. Okay, so not only supply, you know, qualifying on health and safety, financials, um, you know, antibody risk and corruption factors, we also start qualifying on the environmental performance of that company. Mm -hmm. Okay, like just as we are, you know, we, you know, you'll find Hitachi Rail itself as part of the Ecobadis uh, tool. So we have a rating too. And it helps, it helps you get um, an aggregated view on their environmental performance and one that you can then start to drill into. Mm -hmm. So the company will look at their statements around responsible supply chain, use of labor, um, it'll look at their CSR reports, and it'll start to give them a rating against either other, country, uh, other companies in the same country or other companies in the same vertical. And we think that's really useful because as I said, the amount of information in this domain is proliferating at a pace that is really difficult to stay on top of by bringing that, you know, bringing that analysis inside your company. Uh, and I think the other, you know, the other benefit of a platform like Ecovadis is that the, you know, once a company has qualified onto the platform, mm -hmm. that profile becomes available to other people who subscribe to the platform. So, you know, we take the, the kind of the information sharing load out of the supply chain once the company's qualified once anybody within Hitachi can see that, you know, so we were using Echovaris and a couple of other business units as well. And, you know, from there, you're in a position to, as you start to do your supplier selection process, you know, the, the classics of, of cost, quality and, and availability, you can start to add on a fourth there, right? And you can start to do that either at the, the project 
level where you're looking to select a, a supplier for a specific project or if you're in a category management conversation you can start to bring it into the strategic view of the competency of, or and congruency of that supplier to what you're trying to achieve as a business so i think that's a really you know again a, a, a wise maybe not quick win but a wise first step for the procurement community to think about is how can i find a, a reliable source of information that i can bring into my selection and qualification process that makes sure that the project team or the, the category team actually have a data point to look mm -hmm. at that you know it's not going to be completely um objective and neither is it going to be completely quantifiable but it's at least a big step forward and it forces the conversation around the table rory we have a great question about mm -hmm you know, another big part of, of the procurement organization, and, and that's the uh, the focus on diverse owned suppliers and diversity of suppliers. Mm -hmm. How does this link up, how does this commingle with that initiative as well? Mm -hmm. that value? It's interesting. It's, uh, so that's quite, a, that's quite a, a specific question from a US angle. Okay, that's not always a, a requirement in other parts of the world. However, in other parts of the world, you might find yourself working with a government entity that has a requirement around local content. Okay, so it depends very much on what the obligation that you have around either local content or working with minority owned businesses are. I don't think you, you know, if it's a legal obligation, you can't ignore that obligation. So you might be coming through a filtering process that says I have three suppliers, all of which meet the criteria. Fantastic. OK, you have the ability to move three suppliers through. It's whether you want to then filter on their environmental capability before mm -hmm. or after. And I think that do you do it before or do you do it after probably links back to what your legal or operational obligations are on that on that point. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's. It, that's one of the classic challenges that procurement mm -hmm. and supply chain professionals have is that you have to you know you have to meet several different demands um, and it's about you know which of those demands are absolutely must-haves and which are the ones that are negotiable i think you're going to find that the environmental angle will no longer be a negotiable option mm -hmm. you know in, in nine years time it will be far from negotiable for many of us if you're signed up to goals like like attach you have Roy, I'll, I'll just switch hmm. gears here for a minute and, sure. and we are running low on time here, but but how are you linking the accomplishments of decarbonization so far to, to business results? Are you able to see a correlation yet? Um, yes, some of it is really obvious, right? You know, so we've we've just slashed our travel budgets, right? Because we we know that um that people don't actually need to travel as much okay mm -hmm. to still be successful you know we've had a really good couple of years despite covid right um, and we've all learned within the business unit you know how to work effectively globally stuck in my small room in in west london um and you know we're not going to stay there but neither should we return to where we were and i think everybody now has, has made that transition right um <laughs> It's, it's, it's a very, it's difficult sometimes to say, because I've done A, I've achieved B. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true with where we are on the decarbonisation journey just now. I think it will be very clear in maybe five years time, the companies that have been serious about decarbonisation will probably be in a much better place than those that have not. One of the interesting data points I, I looked at recently was the amount of investors dollars that have gone into socially responsible funds or funds that are marketed as being socially uh, responsible versus those that are not and it's very clear that there's been a, a large flow of investors funds into the first bucket and much less into the second and if you take that as a proxy of how consumers view this topic i think it tells you know it, it paints a very clear picture um sometimes for us it can be quite simple to make that connection on a specific project right mm -hmm. so if the project is very clear and the customer's requirements are very clear on you must have this uh, environmental profile and we win that project well i think then you know you can quite clearly say yes there's been a great return on the 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 activities that we put in place to win this bid and it's paid back for the business it would be interesting to think about that from an employee engagement standpoint 
you know, and certainly um, some of the feedback that we've had around, you know, for, for what is the journey that Hitachi's on with regards to the environment? And we had that question from a lot of our employees. And I think some of the, you know, like the announcement Andy put out this week or in, in the past week has helped really set that out very clearly. Um, and I think that's probably one of the benefits. So certainly for younger employees, the, the mm -hmm. passion that the passion and the focus around the environment is clear. It's very evident when you talk to, to, you know, even not so young employees. Um, and I think as a company, being clear on that and having an ambition and having a serious attitude and clear evidence of having acted um, on it is, again, almost a prerequisite for employees, you know, before. It's like a very early filter for employees you know, if we go back to that analogy on the supplier selection piece, I think it's a very early filter now for employees, the, the environmental approach of a company. Completely agree. And we've had a couple of comments for, in our Q&A just about how important it is um, across all generations, but the, the incredible focus on purpose-driven companies, especially mm. from uh, newer generations to the, the workforce. And, and that goes to buyers as well. So, um, so really fantastic. You know, I, um, I, I want to leave it open. We've got a couple of questions mm -hmm. again about measuring, yeah. Uh, yeah. measuring carbon recapture. And so I'll, I'll leave it mm -hmm. to you, Rory, mm -hmm. to, to just talk a bit yeah. more about how you're really kind of looking at the results mm -hmm. internally, externally, and so forth. And then uh, we'll probably have to wrap up soon. Sure. Uh, there's a great question here from Mike Hogan on, you know, what are the gaps in the UK recycling infrastructure that mm -hmm. feel need to be resolved to support a low carbon and construction manufacturing environment? Um, I think there's a cracker, Mike, that's out there and, and ready for uh, a really serious conversation. It is about batteries, right? So to create the, another great data point I came across the other week, to create a 45 kilogram Nissan, I think it's a Nissan Leaf or an automotive battery, you need about 244 kilograms of primary material, right? And to get from 244 to 45, you can imagine there's a lot of energy goes in to make that, uh, that transition. Mm -hmm. I think finding a way to um, disassemble and reuse batteries is gonna be absolutely key, you know, not only for the, the, the metals that are in there, but for the lithium and such like. Um, so there, there's a good one for you, Mike, if you can solve the, uh, the battery mm -hmm. re recycling challenge and, Come and come and see me. It'd be great to catch up with you again. Um, you know, get getting real on this. You know, is about how we then break down into actual action in in detailed areas. So some of the areas we're starting to look at um, within the business unit from a category of spend view is car body shells, right? So we we need to rethink that supply chain. We need to rethink that with the lens on. The environmental, uh, you know, the environmental lens as well as the requirements, the you know the kind of technical side and the commercial side. And um, seats is another area we're looking at. Okay, if you think about what goes into a seat, a lot of the foam and the materials mm -hmm. is not particularly recyclable at the moment. Can we address that challenge? And then another area we are looking at is batteries. Now, we're looking at batteries because of the need for them in our product to help us bridge the gap on areas of the track that's not electrified so we can maybe move away from having diesel engines or replace the diesel engines that are on existing fleets. But similarly, as I said, there is this angle around what do we do with the battery packs when they come to the end of their life? How can we reuse them and make sure that we start to have a kind of a closed loop on the, on the, battery, uh, the battery technology within our trains? So look, I hope that was, I hope that was insightful and useful um, it's been really great to talk to you, Marida. Thank you for asking me to come on. Yeah, absolutely. This has been fantastic and really appreciate you walking us through. I mean, a, a really um, fantastic approach and excited for the journey that Hitachi is going to go on and uh, just appreciate all the detail and, and answering all these questions. Um, I will just point out that my my lights have turned themselves off <laughs> no less than five times during this <laughs> webinar. So <laughs> we're Thank on you. the... We're on the right track at Corbury. I'm, I'm in the office today. So thank you again. Thanks I'm so. going to turn on our poll for everyone to, to give us a little bit of feedback. But thank you again for, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again on uh, next week's webinar on Friday. Thanks very much. Have a great weekend, Meredith. Thank you again. Thank you all. Take care.